right, so we can get settled. I'm gonna give some house rules. If you guys can give me your attention, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Come on, let's try to find a seat, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are y'all? Good. Today is a great day to be a Cub, right? Come on, Cubs. Today is a great day to be a Cub. Is today a great day to be a Cub? Somebody said no. Come on. Where's your school spirit? You've got less than 20 days left to school. And today is a great day to be a cub. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. I hope you all can have a final seat. Thank you for being here for our second annual Cup Talks. We have tried to model the Cup Talks program after TED Talks. Raise your hand if you've ever heard or watched the TED Talk. And if you haven't, if you haven't, I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to go to YouTube go to the internet and pull up uh, a TED talk. And there are TED talks literally about anything that you can imagine that you want to learn more about. And what the whole idea and the concept is about is that they bring together thought leaders. We call them thought leaders and experts in the field. And so it may be a TED talk on nanotechnology. It may be a TED talk on how to get into an elite college or university. It may be a cup talk on, a TED talk on anything that you can imagine. Uh, there are experts in, in our country and in our world that can, can speak to those things. Well, last year, we had the big idea to start what we call cup talks. Uh, and so we wanted to bring together uh, some of our leaders there's just no way possible that we can invite every student from the junior high and the high school here. And we kind of think it would be counterproductive if we had 3,000 students in here at one time versus 500 or so. There's roughly four or 500 of you here today, give or take. And uh, we wanted to allow teachers the opportunity to select you. I did not select you because I don't know each of you individually. I know many of you, but I don't know you like that. Your teachers have said, here is a student that I believe could benefit from being a part of the Cub Talks uh, program. This is what we call the Emerging Leaders Program. We believe the reason why you are here is because someone in your school, whether it's Brenham Junior High or Brenham High School, believe that you possess leadership traits and characteristics that will help lead uh, this nation, this state, and this community uh, further down the road. I believe that as well, and so we're glad you're here, but we want you to conduct yourselves today like the leaders that you have been selected uh, to be. Leadership is not something that you're born with, uh, contrary to popular belief. Leadership is something that can be taught. Leadership is something that can be learned. Leadership is something that can be desired and, and, and you can aspire to be a leader. Raise your hand for me if you believe you are one of those leaders. I think all of you are. Raise your hand. If you're here, you are a leader. If you're here and if somebody looks up to you, you are a leader. The definition, the definition alone for leadership is if someone else follows you, you are a leader. We want to make certain that you are leading others in a positive direction. Okay? And so with that, one of my very first guests are going to be ready to speak in just a few moments. And uh, Ms. Johnston, Jessica Johnston, our Director of Communications and Special Programs, will do all of the introductions. But here are a couple of things that I'd like to take away, I'd like for you to take away. And I hope that you brought a pen or a pencil so that you can just write 
a few nuggets. I don't know that I have a, any nuggets for you today, but I hope that the speakers will have something that you believe you can walk away with uh, that will help you to uh, even be better in class, helping you to prepare yourself for high school, helping you to prepare yourself for college, helping you to prepare yourself for life. Student leaders and smart leaders often, here are some characteristics of leadership. Leaders often change their minds. It's okay to change your mind. You don't have to have your mind fixed on something all the time. It doesn't have to always be fixed on one specific way. Number two, leaders read and write often. Leaders read and write more than anybody else. Read lots of books, research, are constantly surfing, trying to learn new things and new ways of doing things. Number three, leaders have great manners. You have to have good manners. That is something that we don't talk a lot about in schools and talk about in our society anymore, but leaders should and must have good manners. I'll give you an example. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yes, sir, no, sir. A good, firm handshake. Looking someone in the eye when you talk to them. Being a good listener. Those are leadership skills that leaders have. Leaders have good manners. Leaders, number four, leaders talk less but they really say more. Leaders talk less, they listen more, but even in their fewer words, their words have greater power. Number five, leaders are teachable. Y'all listen to me, please. Those of you who don't wanna be here, we can, we can get you back to your schools and to your classes. But y'all don't need to be talking when the leaders are talking, when speakers are talking. All right? Leaders are teachable. Leaders are teachable. Number six, leaders show gratitude. Leaders are gracious. Leaders always say thank you and please and thank you and things like that. Leaders show gratitude. Number seven, Leaders ask more questions. People with a leadership mind are the folks that ask questions in a meeting or in a classroom or in any type of professional or non-professional setting. Number eight, leaders work on problems and work to solve problems. Leaders are in labs right now trying to find the cure for cancer. Leaders seek solutions to our society's problems. That's what we want you to do. That's what your teachers are trying to instill in you. Some of you are gonna become the lawyers and the doctors and the teachers and the politicians that help to solve issues in the future. Number nine, leaders anticipate positive outcomes. And the B part to that is leaders are positive. You don't have to say anything, but have you ever been around somebody that's just always negative, that finds something negative to say about everything? They don't like anybody, they don't like the programming, they don't like what they're doing. Leaders are not negative. Leaders are positive people because they're inspirational. They try to inspire others. Number 10, Leaders surround themselves always. This is a true characteristic of a leader. Leaders surround themselves with people that are always smarter than they are. There's an old quote that says, if you're the smartest person in the room, you should get up and leave the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, you should leave. Leaders surround themselves with other positive, smart thinkers that can help them to grow and to develop. And then lastly, leaders, number 11, leaders seek feedback always. 
I know, and you don't have to say yes or no, but I know you've been around those people that think they know everything, right? You got people in your classes that, you know, they're the one that raises their hand for everything and they're the one that has the answer to everything. Well, leaders, leaders don't always know everything. Leaders are always looking for answers. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here because we want to develop the leader in you. We want to develop the positive, inspirational, caring, nurturing leader in you. Because our world is, is a tough world and we need positive, inspirational, solid, well-trained leaders that can help solve the complex problems that we have in Brenham, in Texas, in North America, and in the world. I hope today that you will enjoy the speakers that are gonna come forth and that you take notes and that you walk away with some wisdom nuggets that you can use in your seventh, eighth grade class, your ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade class. And if you're on your way to Texas A&M, Rice University, Columbia University, the University of Texas Baylor, Prairie View, Texas Southern, wherever you're headed, we want you to take what you hear today to make your life better. And now without further ado, we're gonna ask Ms. Jessica Johnson to come and introduce our guests. Thank you and I hope you have a wonderful day. Good morning and thanks for being here today. Um, I echo what Dr. Jackson said, that you have been chosen to be here because somebody thinks that you're a developing student leader at Brenham ISD. And um, just appreciate your attention today. Like the screen said earlier, it is a mobile-friendly zone, so if you want to post on social media, if you want to celebrate the learning here today, we invite you to do that. It's hashtag Cub Talks. Please silence your phone, though, and be a respectful listener. Um, the speakers today have donated their time, and they're all very busy in their daily lives, so we're grateful that they're here. Um, our first speaker, many of you already know, um, he's going to talk to you guys about leadership and perseverance. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our Assistant Athletic Director, Coach Danny Ramsey. Good morning. Good morning. Do I need to get all up in this mic like this to be loud? Oh my goodness, y'all gotta wake up. This ain't gonna work. Hey, you get right now, right now. I need you to get your hands. Get them up. Stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Raise your hand if you believe that you want to be great. Raise your hand. 
See, that's what I'm saying. Like, if every hand doesn't completely pop up right in the air, then we're missing something. And we are. And that's why we're here. To give you that little bit of extra so that you do understand that every single person in this room has the opportunity and the calling. You have the, the right and actually the responsibility to be great, not to be just average. The responsibility to be great. So let's start here. Attitude. You get to choose that every morning. How many of you heard me talk about this before? Raise your hand. Yeah. Hey, attitude is your choice. When you roll out of bed in the morning, you can land on one of two things. Well, you can land on a bunch of different things. But if you land on your feet, everything's good, yes? Yeah, the day's going to be fine. If you land on your head, what do you think? Yeah, some of you are saying words you shouldn't be saying. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. <laughs> There you go. Hey, even if it was fake, you're faking it till you make it. I love it. Good. All right, so when you roll out of bed, you land on your feet, everything's great. You roll out of bed, you land on your head, what? You're thinking it's going to be one of those days. And you know what? The power of your mind says you're exactly right. If you roll out of bed, land on your head, and you say to yourself that day is not going to be what you wanted it to be, then you are exactly right. You are self-fulfilling prophecy, and that's not what you're all about. That's not what being great is all about. Being great is deciding that because of that, or in spite of that, my day is still going to be phenomenal. That didn't have anything to do with my decisions. I didn't choose to roll out of bed and land on my head. You see where I'm going with this? It's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to what happens to you. And if you decide beforehand, put reminders all over the place, that you're going to have a great day because you're choosing to do so, then you get a chance to be great. If you don't, you are you are condemning yourself to no way. It's not going to happen. The day's going to be one of those days. Why not make one of those days one of those days? You hear what I'm saying? Good. You picking up what I'm putting down? Good. So look, it's your responsibility to be great. It's your responsibility to have a great attitude. It's your responsibility to choose joy. It's yours. It's not anybody else's. It's your responsibility to do so. It's yours to manage. So for instance, how many of you have a cell phone that your parents bought? Raise your hand. Parents bought you? A <laughs> lot more hands than I thought was gonna be, but here's the deal. So if your parents bought the phone and gave it to you, is it now yours? No, it is yours to manage. If they're paying the bill, it's theirs. You're on rent. And it's your responsibility to manage it. Guess what? God gave you joy. And it's yours to manage. It is not anybody else's to take or have. It is yours to manage. Gandhi said, I would not let um, the dirty feet of anyone else tread through my mind. Meaning, when he's talking to other people or interacting with other people, whatever it is they've said or done will not dirty his mind. His mind is going to be what he chooses it to be. Joyful, peaceful. Eleanor Roosevelt said the same thing. She said that your joy is yours. And nobody can snatch it from you unless... If you don't padlock that sucker, if you don't lock the locker up and it gets stolen, it's on you. It's yours. It's your joy. It's your choice. Everybody understand? Good. So who's joyful right now? There you go. Choose. And if you're not, choose anyway. Choose joy anyway. Smile. You'd be surprised what difference it makes. All right. Here we go. Next. Look, you've got to be intentional. And here, this, this rides right along with the whole attitude thing. Okay. You've got to be intentional. You've got to do things on purpose with a purpose. It is not acceptable for you to get up one morning and say, whatever happens, happens. No. Be intentional. If you're being great, you can't go along with whatever the flow is. You have to know that I've got a plan. I've got an, a, an action plan that in case this happens, I'm going to choose this. If this happens, which I'm expecting it to, then this is how I'm going to proceed. You gotta be intentional because everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. You have a purpose. You know, you were created for the purpose, like the purpose existed, and then God said, okay, I'm gonna create a being that's going to fulfill this purpose. There you go. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like God said, here you, here you are, and then, hey, you know what? I think I'm gonna go find something for them to do. No, that's your job. His job was, here's the purpose, create you, now you gotta fulfill it. And you gotta be intentional about it. You must be intentional about it. You have to do things 
on purpose, with a purpose. You've heard this, uh, this is a real big buzzword over the last probably two years, is knowing your why. Yeah? Have you heard that? It's important for you to know your why? Yes? No? Am I speaking to zombies? When you stand up again and start power clapping? Ah, no. Don't do power clap. Everybody laughed and smiled. Don't do that again. The size of your why, here's the thing. You, you got to know your why. Why is it that you're doing whatever it is you're doing? So, um, okay, I see Parker back there. Parker, where are we going to school? a and &M. So you've got a why as to why you're going to A&M, right? Right? So look, is that a huge why? Yes. Yes, it's, choosing your, it's determining your path right now for at least the next four years, correct? So if your why is that big, guess how big your how has to be? Huge. If your school got chosen for you, that's a different thing. Not normal. That doesn't normally happen. But when you choose a college, when you choose a place that you're going to live for the next four years, not visit, live, pack your stuff up and go, be on your own for the next four years of your life, that's a big why. How you're attacking it ought to be just as big. And I think where the disconnect is sometimes in our leadership, when we're trying to be leaders, is that we don't make that same connection. We have huge whys, but we don't know how. And instead of attacking it with 100%, we only attack it with 50 because we're fearful. And bottom line is fear is false evidence appearing real. You can knock that stuff off. Fear is actually fuel. If you'll use it that way. If you don't, it will squash you. And that's not what you're about. Because you want to be great. You said so just a minute ago, correct? And if you didn't say so, you still have the opportunity to be. You were called here for a purpose. You were pulled out for a purpose because many people are following you, looking up to you, or admire the work that you've put in thus far. You've got to talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself. Look, the world is full of negativity. The world is full of can'ts. But you need to choose can. You need to speak it, and you gotta be intentional. And I wish I could have put a picture up here, but I didn't. Schedule it. If you got a feeling that there's three tests, there, if there's three tests coming up on Wednesday, and you're scared of them, you're like, I studied for one of them, I didn't study for the other two, I don't know what the heck's gonna go on. The only way to approach that at that point is to make sure that you've got confidence in the things that you've done to lead up to it. Your how is all of those homeworks that led up to that test. The why was the test. If you're not thinking about those things intentionally, it's passing you by. You're re reacting instead of responding. You've got you've to respond. And the only way to respond is if you've got a plan first. If you've got an intention first. Otherwise, you're in reaction mode, you're on defense, and defense backs up. Schedule it. Put an alarm. Hey, all those phones with all those hands that went up, you got alarms on all those phones. Why wouldn't you put an alarm on that phone every morning that says, hey, you know what? I'm going to choose joy this morning. Why wouldn't you do that? You have it there. If you've got a dry erase, you've heard me do this before, and I have this on another talk that I've had, and, and I don't know if you were in here or not, but it's irrelevant. On my mirror at home, there are dry erase markings all over that thing to remind me what it is I am and who it is I am and what it is I'm about. Ephesians 3.20 is sitting on my board. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what I could ever think or imagine. He is, if I let him have it. That's on, my, that's on my mirror at home. Why would you not write everything that you've ever heard that inspires you and it may or may not be this fat guy standing up in front of you? It could be a number of things. It could be something you read. It could be something a text that a friend sent you. It could be a smile from Jackson Miller back there who's the sous chef in my kitchen of offense. That inspires me. But those things you've got to put up, you've got to celebrate those kind of victories and that leads me to the next thing. How many of you... So, let's do this. Take your right hand, index finger, put it on the shoulder of the person next to you. Doesn't matter which one. Whichever one's easiest, how about that? Okay? Everybody got it? Easy to do? Yes or no, easy to do? Good, okay, so, 
Let's see how many of you get this. Let's, let's see. Yes. Yes. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Don't be too slow. I want to like run. I can't. Because I'm late. Because I'm late. Because I'm late. Where you at? You want some? Yeah. 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 You gonna pass it down? You gonna squeeze all the way over? You gonna sit over here in the corner and hide? My microphone only goes so far. Right? Can I drop this and go give high fives, Dr. J? I'm going around. Now what you're missing is an entire wall. This auditorium doesn't exist without that entire wall. 
celebrate little victories because little is not a word. Victories is the word. Next, you're going to love this word. Oh, I went two times. How many of you like the word discipline? Nobody. Because most of the time you're talking about discipline, you're thinking about the fact that you are giving, you're being given discipline. You're being granted discipline, right? For something that you've messed up. But the truth of the matter is discipline <laughs> is easy to do. And I'll explain something about, well, I'll tell you that. Discipline is something that you do every day. It's something you choose to do even in the midst of adversity. It's something you choose to do even when you don't want to do it, such as getting up out of bed, such as making your bed every morning, such as doing a workout when you're trying to get stronger, faster, bigger. Let me, uh, I didn't tell you to take your hands down, and I'm not playing Simon Says, but it was very easy to take that finger and put it on the shoulder of the person next to you, right? You know what, if it's very easy to do, it's also what? Very easy not to do. How many people still have their finger on the shoulder of the person next to them? Nobody. Because we let it go. Because it was ours to manage, but we managed it with them. Maybe he didn't really mean to hold it there for the period of time or the length of the entire presentation. Proof. It's easy to do. It's also very easy not to do. But you need to do it anyway. You've got to do it anyway. I'm imploring you to do it anyway. Here's the deal. There are two pains in life, and unfortunately, you don't get to know the second pain until you've chosen not to deal with the first pain. There's the pain of discipline, which is choosing every day to do the things you know you need to do in order to be great, or even just to accomplish something, or finish something. That's the pain of discipline. But when you choose not to, there's the pain of regret, and unfortunately, you can't go back and redo that. You're granted time. Time is the resource that you cannot get back. And when it's gone, you can say, hey, I can make it up tomorrow. That's not existing. That is not a true statement. It does not exist. You cannot have yesterday back. You can have tomorrow to try to catch up on the assignment that you had, but you do not get yesterday back. You're not promised tomorrow. So what are you doing with today? What are you doing with today? What are you doing to intentionally tell yourself to combat all those things that are popping up on your phone? Whether you put the things on your phone or somebody sent them to your phone, that all the companies that want to make money are sending stuff to your phone because you've got a phone. It's called marketing. If I put a can of Coke up there that didn't say Coca-Cola but had the same designs on it, every one of you would be able to tell me that it was a Coca-Cola can. The issue is, and the reason why is because they've marketed it to you in everything. In everything, every commercial you've ever watched, every TV show that you watch and get hooked on, all those shows that you've got on your phone that you didn't pay the extra for, so they still show the ad and the ad is there and it's got a Coke can on it. It's called marketing. They've done that to you to get you to buy Coke or at least know what it looks like. If you can tell them that, they've done their job. You ever seen the signs as you're driving down the road that says, hey, you want to advertise your business? You just did. And it's not rented yet, but they want to rent that sign. That's why. It's phasing on your mind. And here's the thing. We've gone numb to it. You've gone numb to it. You didn't even know that until I gave it to you, did you? And we've gone numb to it. So anything that they want to put in there that's negative, they can slap it in there. And there are folks who will negatively try to take advantage of you and your money, you and your time, you and your attention. There's a ton of them. Why? Because they want to make money or whatever reason. That's irrelevant. What is relevant is you control your mind. So if you're not intentional about it, though, everything that you let slide in there is going to affect your mindset. It's why not a third of you held your hands up when I said, how many of you want to be great? Because you've been affected by the fact, ah, maybe I just don't really care whether this guy's speaking to me or not today. Maybe I don't care really that one or two or eight people nominated me to be in this room because they felt that I could change the entire Not everybody has that. Not everybody's in this auditorium from this district, or even this school. But you are. What are you gonna do with it? Can you be disciplined in the daily so that you don't feel regret when you leave? When you don't feel like it? And let me just tell you, feelings are just feelings, and I'm an emotional person. Obviously, you've seen that. I'm pretty passionate about what it is I'm doing. But if you don't do something because your feelings say don't, you'll be ruled by your feelings from this point until you decide otherwise. It's a matter of being intentional. 
what it is you want from your life, from this, from any moment, from any class. It's what you want. What you want. You've got to define what you want. How many of you thought about what you want to see in your life when you're 30 years old? Raise your hand if you've thought about it. If you haven't, don't be embarrassed. It's all right. But that's my point. There you go. So some are leaning back on that chair. They're just staring at the, uh, and they're looking at the back of their eyelids. Some are paying as close attention as they possibly could to this person who's speaking to them right now. Some are taking notes. Some are recording it, seeing if they can put something funny on IG. What are you doing with this moment? It's, it's, still, it's still completely up to you, but when you feel like it versus when you don't feel like it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you do it anyway. You know the truth, you know what's right. You know what it is to be great and to accomplish greatness. If you'll just continue to sew the stitches, if you'll just continue to lay the bricks, if you just keep the atoms together. But it's a choice, and it's yours. And yeah, I'm up here trying to convince you that, <laughs> that it's the right choice. Last thing I got for you. I know y'all love this. Brace the sun. Oh, two sips up. Yeah. But here's the deal. Everything in life, not anything or some things or every now and then, if you've got a pain in life, it is meant for your good. I don't think you heard me. If you've got a pain in life, if there's something that's bugging you, if there's something that is annoying you, if there's something that's giving you trouble, it is meant for your good. Everything is meant for your good. It's how you react to those things that makes you who you are. Everything is meant for your good. So if you can embrace the nasty, the trial, the challenge, the difficult, the workout, the my feelings don't tell me that I want to do this, if you can embrace that, greatness is waiting for you. It's waiting for you. It's yours to manage. It's waiting for you. Look, trials are promised. You're going to come in here tomorrow. Cheerios ain't going to taste the same. You're going to wake up in a week and your ankle's going to hurt. You're going to wake up in two weeks and realize you just wasted the last two weeks and didn't study like you should have for final. All of those things are trials. They're still choices of yours. But the choice is what you do with the trial. What do you do with that trial? They're promised. They're coming. They're coming. I wish I could tell you it's probably it's uh, rainbows and lollipops to be great. It's not. It's everything in the opposite. The, the world will publicize all of the rainbows and lollipops so that you look at it and go, yes, yeah, great, it's awesome. Man, if I could have a million dollars because I played the NBA, woohoo, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is. But do you know what got that guy there? Sure, there's an ability when he's six foot seven and can dribble the ball like a master. That's something that helps. But he had to work to get there because there's a bunch of dudes who are six foot seven can't dribble their way out of a paper bag. It's the truth. Ten thousand hours of expertise, ten thousand hours of instruction. Those are the things that they say that in order to be an expert in the field, you have to put ten thousand hours worth of work into those things. That may or may not be true, but I do know this: that that ten thousand hours didn't come from them sitting around. And it definitely didn't come from them wondering in their bed whether or not they should get up that morning and do the workout that they were asked to do or that they know that they need to do in order to achieve. Here's a, a little story for you that you can take and, and uh, <laughs> kind of try to reiterate the point. There's uh, these psychologists are doing a test and they take these two young men, they're twins, the Bayless twins, and they're going to do a test on why it is one twin, we'll say twin A, um, why it is that his attitude was so fantastic and why it is twin B's attitude was so terrible. And they thought, you know, surely they're twins. They grew up in the same house. How did this happen? They have the same stimuli. They have the same things happening in their lives. So why, why would they be so different? So they took twin A. Now, twin A is the one who's got a great attitude, right? Right? Okay, so they took twin A. They put him in a basement. There was one single pull to the light, an entire mound of manure. They put him in that basement. You're gonna be in here for an hour, that's what they told me, okay? They took Twin B and they put him in a room full of candy, every single candy you know to mankind. Said you're gonna be in here for an hour. No repercussions, no nothing. This room is yours, take what you want. They came back in an hour, they go to the candy room, and the boy, Twin B, bad attitude, right? Twin B comes out of the room and he is 
fussing. He is so mad. And they're like, what? How did this happen? So they start to ask him questions. And he doesn't even let them start to ask questions before he says, man, I can't believe they didn't have recent pieces in that stinking room. Every candy known to mankind didn't have recent pieces. So he was upset. They went down to the basement to check on Twin B. Or Twin A. Twin A, right? Twin A. So they, they, they went down the basement to check on Twin A. And they can't find him. Like, where, like where'd he go? It's a closed off basement. It's not like he's got an extra door to go anywhere. There's somebody standing at the door the entire hour. He's not there. They're like calling his name. Hey! Where are you? Hey! Where are you? Twin A! Where are you? And finally, after the third time, he pops up out of the middle pile of manure. Hey! I win! Do I win? Do I win? And they're like, what is he talking about? He said, we were playing hide and seek, right? We play hide and seek. I win, right? I win. What's the difference in the two twins? Completely attitude. It's the choice of the attitude, right? He chose to take the pile of manure and make it a game. The other one chose to take all of that candy and deny it because his favorite wasn't there. It was completely a choice. All the same stimulus. All the same things given to both of them. And the choice was what made the difference. The choice. And how bad of the choices was there along that whole 10 years of life when they were growing up? How many times did they choose those things in order to get them into that attitude from that point? And how many days from this point, from the time you were born, have you let one of those things pull you in one direction or the other? Look, <laughs> embrace the suck. It's there for you to take. But the thing about it is, if you do, Greatness awaits you. And the reason that those three verses are up there is because if it was important enough for Jesus to say it three times, which he did, in every one of those verses, it's recorded. And I, I believe it's in, um, I believe it is in John as well, but I didn't find it. Uh, but three times he said, when the trials come, don't run from them. Embrace them. Look, you all have tremendous potential to be great leaders. So ridiculously honored to speak to y'all today. I want to have you do these things, these ABCs to being great. Attitude, attitude equals joy. Choose joy every day. Be intentional about being great. Don't just let life hit you in the face because if you don't choose, life will choose for you. Celebrate all of the little things because they aren't little. They're huge. Sew stitches. Put them together and let the quilt of your life be the greatness that's within you. You hear what I'm saying? Discipline yourself. Choose discipline. Don't choose regret because when regret gets here, you can't get it back. And the last thing is embrace the sun. Because it's coming. But if you can embrace it, then what's left in life but greatness? There's no way to go but up. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. to thank some people who helped to organize this event. All this is a lot of work. So um, Jennifer Fox, Maddie Ruiz, Jenny Shear, and Christy Van Dyke, if you were in the audience, would you please stand so we can thank you? So our next speaker you've probably seen at school events or around town. She is a former Brenham Junior High School teacher. She is the mom of two Burnham ISD students. She is a professional photographer and social media manager, and y'all, she's the president of the Burnham ISD School Board. She is one of the reasons that we're able to do all of these wonderful things in Burnham ISD, one of the reasons that you have access to the most quality programming in our area. So please help me welcome Natalie Lane. Thank you. Hello, and thank you all for having me here this morning. And thank you to Brim ISD for hosting such an incredible event for our students. Like Mrs. Johnston said, my name is Natalie Lacey Lane, and today I want to talk to you about the rewards of getting out of your comfort zone. This up here, this is not my comfort zone. Coach Ramsey, he blows, blows us away with 
that kind of energy, but um, my comfort zone is pretty much at home. Um, I'm an introvert, so basically if I'm out in public, I'm kind of out of my zone. I want to be home with my husband, my kids, and maybe a small group of friends or family. That's how I recharge. But growth and achievement and making a difference by serving, all of those things happen outside of my comfort zone. Before we get too into that, I want to tell you a little about, it, about who I am and what I do. I'm a wife and a mom, and I currently serve as president of the Brenham ISD Board of Trustees. I work as a commercial photographer and social media manager here in Burnham. In the last couple of years, I've been published for editorial photography in Better Homes and Gardens, Houstonia Magazine, Paper City, and, and some others that I'm really proud of. It's always fun to see um, my work in print, but the majority of my work is for social media and for advertising. You're seeing some of my recent work in this slideshow, and I snuck a few in of my kids. You'll see some of those in a minute. You might notice that the images that you see are taken in and around Brenham. They cover about a 20 mile radius from where you're sitting right now. I included only local images for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm hoping they might help you look at our town a little differently than I did at your age. And two, because one of my jobs is to share everything to do and see in the Burnham area, and I really love what I do. And if you want to follow, visit Burnham on Instagram, I would love that. Okay, let's get back to comfort zones. Now, I don't pretend to have all the answers about being happy and successful, but when I look back at my life so far, the moments that led me here all started with me getting out of my comfort zone. I hope that one of the experiences that I share with you today might inspire you to take a step out of your familiar territory and give yourself some room to grow. Now I want you to think about your routines, who you spend your time with, what activities you're involved in, the way you approach your schoolwork, and even your job if you have one. I would loosely define a comfort zone as how you spend your time when you have a choice. So even though you don't have a choice about coming to school and maybe being here right now, you do get to choose your classes and your extracurricular activities. But what about those times in life when you really don't have a choice? Sometimes we're simply forced out of our safety net by no choosing of our own. It might be a divorce, a move, a death of the loved one. Unfortunately, no matter how old you get, we are not immune to these situations. Life loves to keep teaching us that we are not in control of everything. But these are the times that give us opportunity to grow. We can grow bitter, or we can grow better. One of the pivotal times that I was forced out of my comfort zone started right before high school. And I promise you, I was on the path to bitter instead of better. My family moved here at the end of my eighth grade year. It was a difficult transition, to say the least. And by difficult transition, I mean I didn't want to be here, didn't want to move here, and I really, really just wanted to go back to where we had moved from. I wanted my old school, my old friends, my old boyfriend. And it wasn't until my sophomore year that I truly let my guard down here. For the first time, I quit counting the days until our next trip back to where we moved from. I finally accepted our new home and even learned to embrace it a little. And of course, things immediately started getting better. I made friends with people who I am still friends with to this day. I became more involved in school activities besides just sports, and I finally started taking on leadership roles. By my senior year, I had been elected class president, and most importantly, I started dating the guy who I eventually married. It's still odd to think that one of the most difficult times in my life led me right to where I am today, right where I'm supposed to be. And I've learned that's just part of life. The hard times give us empathy and they become part of our story. If you're in the middle of one of these forced transitions, try to grow better instead of bitter. Hang in there and trust that you might be ready, more ready for your next chapter than you realize. As high school graduation grew near for me, even though I had finally embraced life in Brenham, I still couldn't wait to graduate and get out of here. If someone had told me that I would move back to Brenham after college, I would have laughed. But I looked at Brenham differently after five years away. It's funny how having a choice versus having no control can change your perspective. So let's talk about choices. 
There are plenty of times when we don't have control over a situation, but there are just as many when the choice is all up to us. These choices come in all shapes and sizes, and sometimes the choice is so small we don't even realize the impact it can have until later. And these are some of the times when being intentional about getting out of a comfort zone can have a huge impact. I've seen this especially in my current career. I can look back at all the little choices that led me to where I am now, which is with a flexible job that I enjoy. One of the seemingly small choices I made three years ago led me to one of my biggest clients. I had some downtime and wanted to go take pictures of a new venue down the road in Round Top. I was interested in working with them, but I didn't have a real plan. It was going to be crowded, and I figured I could just show up with my camera and blend in, maybe tag them on social media, and it might eventually lead to a job. But I happened to run into the director there, and she noticed me taking pictures. We started talking, and she ended up hiring me on the spot. My role with them has grown, and I know that my success with them was key in growing my business to where it is today. And it all started with a little choice to put myself out there just a bit. Be intentional. Make the small choices that will stretch you now, but will lead you somewhere you want to be in the future. For me, it might mean leaving the comfort of home to get the shot that leads to my next job. For you, it might mean taking a class that none of your friends are taking, or trying out for an activity that isn't what you've always done. Take the first step, and another first step, and another, until one day you can look back at that one little choice that puts you on the path to success. And try not to worry about failure. That's one of those things that's easy to say, but a little bit harder to do. Sometimes that fear of failure is paralyzing. We, ended up, we end up playing it safe by not moving forward. But at what cost? What opportunities do we miss out on? When I'm feeling frozen by the fear of failing, I go through all the what ifs. But the best question I can ask myself is, what is the worst thing that could happen? When I was debating leaving one career to pursue another, sorry, I could go through all the what ifs, but the best question that I asked myself at that time was, what's the worst thing that could happen? I just couldn't decide, I couldn't move forward, but I didn't think I should stay where I was. When I asked myself that question and I actually answered it, I could see that I was okay with the answer. I knew what I would do if that worst thing came true. At that point, I could make my decision and move forward, so I did. And just know that there will always be a million reasons not to do something. I promise we can talk ourselves out of anything if we give ourselves the opportunity, and if it means that we don't have to leave the comfort and our sense of security. The last piece of advice I have for you about stepping out of what's familiar is really about the people you surround yourself with. There's a saying that it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. That saying usually refers to people in high places, but that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people that you choose to be with, your friends and family, your inner circle, the people who encourage you and give you that nudge when you're considering a leap of faith. When I look back at pivotal moments in my life, there was always someone there to encourage me. When I was just considering running for the school board, my mother-in-law was sure that I was the right person. I was still stuck on all the reasons why I shouldn't do it, but she was already volunteering to be my campaign manager and organizing events for me. She helped push me out of my comfort zone. And I want to be the kind of wife, the kind of mother, the kind of friend, the kind of school board member who believes in people so much that they start to believe in themselves too. I hope that those kind of people are in your life. And if not, I hope that you'll find them. And I also hope that you'll try to be that person for someone else. If not, maybe that's a way that you can apply this and get out of your comfort zone and look for your people. Get out of your zone, go and grow. Thank you. Please help me give one more round of applause for our school board president. At this time, 
time, we're going to take a little break from our speakers and we're going to engage you in an activity. Um, I believe Ms. Fox is on her way up here to kind of transition you to the next thing. We still have some wonderful speakers lined up for you this morning, so I ask that you remain respectful. Give us just one second to get this switched over. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, Ms. Uh, Knable here is going to give you some instructions, but you are going to need your phone. So go ahead and get your phone out. Okay, guys, we're going to try something. We're going to try something we haven't tried before, so we want you guys to bear with us and see if we can pull this off. So we are going to play a big game of Gim Kit. So we're going to see if we can get all of you guys on. If for some reason we have trouble because we overload the network, it's okay. We will partner up with somebody, but we do have prizes for the top three winners. Okay. So we are going to put your game code in, and you guys, raise your hand if you've played this before. Okay, so I don't need to give instructions. We're going to get started. Um,
Carson Holton is in third. So right now, oh no, it's gonna keep changing. Alden, I'm impressed, I'm impressed.
two minutes left. In high school, you're still being beat. Just, yeah. I think it's Tamika, I think she's cheating. I'm sorry, Miss Raven would never do that. Do for me. 
So first of all, I want you to understand that your resume, even a student resume, can be a ticket to more than a career. Because at 13, 14, 17, you may not be thinking about a career yet. A resume can be your ticket to a student internship. It could be your ticket to a scholarship. It could be your ticket to college admissions. College admissions officers are looking to see what are our students coming to the university or our college with. I also want you to understand that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. You've probably heard that before. Um, probably 20 years ago, when uh, my husband and I were newly married, we were getting all of these wedding invitations for all of our friends that were also getting married. And when you open up an invitation for a wedding or some big party, some of you may be getting graduation invitations, you pull that invitation out and don't lie. You know you make a judgment about the event based on what the invitation looks like. If it looks like loving hands at home, you're probably like, eh, maybe I'll skip that one. If it looks really beautiful and sophisticated, you're excited to go. So keep in mind that your resume, in many instances, is your first impression. That is the first thing people see about you, even if you're not applying for a job, even if it just happens to come across their desk. So a resume doesn't have to be anything over-engineered. It doesn't have to be super, super sophisticated. It's just a simple <coughs> one-page document that tells your story. Here are a couple of things that you want to focus on your best attributes. Every single one of you are in here because you're doing something exceptional. And, and I'll tell you what, we're, we're going to do just a little, um, a quick little demonstration. Because you may not think what you are doing is exceptional. You may think it's just what you do every day. You go to school, you work hard. Raise your hand if you have a part-time job. Okay, so you're already building your resume even if you don't know it. But you're so used to that just being your daily routine that it doesn't seem exceptional to you anymore. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to clap a song. And I want you to see if you can guess what that song is. Okay, you ready? When everybody get ready. I'm going to clap it and I want you to, to tell me what it is. Here we go. Okay. No, I don't have to go Okay, I, I'm going to do it one more time because maybe you just missed it. Okay? Get ready to listen. You go to school, you try your best, maybe you volunteer at church, maybe you help out at home, maybe there's a nonprofit organization that you are in involved with. All of those things seem like normal everyday stuff to you, but they may not to a college admissions officer, to somebody who's re reviewing a scholarship application. So keep in mind, all of those things that you are doing make you exceptional. So a couple of things that you wanna include on your resume. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Definitely have your contact information with your brenumk-12.net email address for those of you that are getting ready to graduate. You have a little window of time after you graduate that you can still access that email address. However, as you start kind of getting near to graduation, you're going to want to transition all of that information to a personal email address. And Ms. Branton, who's your instructional technology specialist here at the high school, is wonderful at sending out that information. Please be so careful when you choose your email address moving forward beyond the Brenham ISD. Choose wisely. Because again, that's your brand. That's, that's the first impression that some people may have of you. And if you're going to put it on a resume, you want it to be semi-professional. Um, all of your education information, your name and address um, of Burnham High School, your GPA, if it's impressive, um, your class rank, any college courses that you may have taken, any activities that you're involved in. Y'all, this could be babysitting, it could be CPR certification, it could be your part-time job, it could be volunteering at your church. You are involved in more than you think. Sports, 
theater, fine arts, any of those things need to go on your resume because it just shows that you're putting yourself out there and you're building your leadership capacity. Any other experience that you might have, you know, if you um, volunteer to work the Blue Bell Fun Run, put it on there. If you do something downtown, if you were part of local history day, put that on there. All of those things are excellent to show your leadership skills on your student resume. Accolades, any awards that you've received, and references. Now, with references, on a student resume, you may not need to list 10 or 15 people that they're gonna contact. However, you might want to tap those teachers and coaches or people that you volunteer with just to say, hey, look, I'm applying for a scholarship or I'm applying to get into college or I'm looking to land an internship. May I use you as a reference? Um, even if you don't put it on your resume, it's good to kind of give those people a heads up that they may be contacted to speak on your behalf. So some resume do's and don'ts. I'm going to show you some Resumes that maybe missed the mark, and we'll talk a little bit about why that happened. And then I'll show you some that I think are pretty solid, and then I'm gonna show you mine, because it's a little bit of a blend of both. So I'm putting myself out there and showing you guys something that's very personal to me. So here are some resumes that missed the mark. Now, as a 13, 14, 17 year old, you may look at this and be like, well, they're not terrible. It's just not the most professional way to present yourself. It doesn't have to be this busy. It doesn't have to have all of these elements. Simple is best. Just keep it simple. You don't have to, you don't want the person who's reviewing your resume to have to work for it. Don't make me have to look and search for those components that I'm trying to find. And this next one, another cool. No doubt, like if you're a graphic artist or you're into graphic design, I mean, I can look at this and say, upon first glance, th these are really neat. It's just not appropriate for a student resume. It's not appropriate for a professional publication. These are great posters or advertisements or marketing pieces, but they're over-engineered for something that should just be really super simple. So let me show you two examples of really clean student resumes so that as you're kind of formulating what yours might look like, and y'all start it now. Even if you're in seventh grade, open up a Google Doc and just kind of start doing bullet points of the things that you're involved in. That way when you get ready to need it, you don't have to think back, oh my God, what was it that I did in the, the seventh grade that I can't even remember. We have the, the beauty of Google Docs right now. Keep it in your drive for when you need it. So these are two really clean examples of student resumes. And a few things that I want to point out to you. You'll notice up at the top, the name is the first thing you see. It's nice and big and bold. Please, for the love of all that is holy, do not use a big old scrolly cursive script that nobody can read. Keep it really simple. Ariel, Times New Roman, uh, Josephine Sands is one of my favorites. So it doesn't have to be really fancy to make a good impression. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can structure your resume, you can do it chronologically. This is what I did in junior high. This is what I did in high school. Or you can kind of do it by theme. These are my qualifications. These are my skills. So there's kind of two um, areas that you can focus on in terms of skills. There are soft skills. Have you heard that term before? Soft skills are those things you, you can't really measure. Um, good at public speaking. Um, a people person, driven, hard worker, organized. Those are soft skills that people are looking for more and more. Are you well-rounded? Can you get the job done? Do you have good work ethic? Your hard skills are the things that are tangible and measurable. I can, I'm proficient in Adobe and design. I am you know, a straight A student. Those are those hard skills. So there's a couple of different ways that you can structure this. You'll notice on this one that's on the left, on the right-hand column, that's where they're putting their skills and qualifications. The resume on the right, it's more worked into the body of the resume. So however you choose to structure it, just keep it simple, keep it clean, and brag. This is your chance to brag on you. I know that, and, and you guys are much younger than me, but I was raised not to brag. My parents always, always said, don't brag, don't toot your own horn, it's, it's rude, it's unbecoming, nobody wants to hear that. Now is the time for you to brag on your student resume. This is where you can showcase all of the wonderful things that you're doing as an emerging leader in Brunham ISD. So this is my resume. 
And the reason I show it to you is because I want you to see that I didn't want just like a plain white with bullet points. Like it didn't really feel like me. You want your recipe to feel like you. You want it to be something that you believe in so that you're invested in it. So I have a little bit of a different template here. Um, you'll see on the left side, I have my social media accounts. If you're proud of your social media activity, include it. Be mindful though, if your social media activity does not reflect who you are as a developing leader, steer clear and make some better choices. Um, and then mine is chronological. So I started with my experience over on the right hand side down towards the bottom of the page. I list my achievements, any awards that I've won, um, down at the bottom my affiliations, all of the, um, the groups that I'm a member of. And then on the left hand sidebar, there's my educational experience, my skills, and then my contact information. So you can take a really traditional resume outline and sort of merge it with something that feels a little bit more like you, and there's nothing wrong with that. So as we're wrapping up, I want to give you three tips for success as you start thinking about this. And I'm going to challenge you. If you don't already have a student resume started, put that on your sort of Fab Five to-do list. Just start a Google Doc and start making those bullet points with the things that you're involved in at school today. First of all, proofread. Oh, you guys. Find a critical friend or two or five or ten to look at your resume and give you feedback. I have lots of critical friends. When I'm doing publications for Brenham ISD, I cringe a little bit every time I hit send because I'm always afraid that I've missed something. So Dr. Jackson sometimes looks over my work. Uh, my secretary looks over my work. I have friends in central office that will look over my work. Sometimes the teachers that help develop these events look over my work. Even as a professional in Brenham ISD, I'm still developing. So proofread, proofread, proofread. Even one typo or one mistake on your resume can cause someone to put yours aside and go on to the next one. Formatting, it should be easy to read. Don't make people work to find your information. Keep it simple, keep it clean, and then be honest. I know we all want to be the best. I know we all want to be at the top, we wanna to shine, we wanna showcase all of our efforts. Do not embellish what you have been involved in. What you've done is enough. You don't have to embellish your experiences to get what you're trying to get as a developing student leader. And I'll tell you too, if you need help, I am so happy to look over any of your stuff. As a former teacher in Brenham ISD, I've been out of the classroom for over a decade now. Uh, my joke is I love to work with real life kids. So if you ever think, God, I wonder if Mrs. Johnston would just look at this for me, I would be happy to do that. I'm in the BrenhamK-12.net directory. You can share it with me in Google Drive. I will give you my very honest feedback. Um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it because I don't think anybody grows in that way. but. Please find someone, a teacher, a friend, myself, that can help you look at that with a critical eye and give you the feedback to make sure that it represents the developing leader that you are. So your challenge in the next couple of weeks is to start that Google Doc, start thinking about the wonderful things that you're involved in so that when an opportunity arises that you need your student resume, you have it ready to give. So at this point, we are going to um, transition to our next speaker, and um, I'll ask you to give me just a minute while we get that set up, but thank you for being such a great audience and great listeners today. Okay, guys, so we're going to go ahead and circle up, and then I'm so excited about our next two speakers. As developing student leaders in this community, you are so fortunate to have access to college programming right here in our community with Blinn College. So our next two speakers do come to us from the Blinn Brenham campus. And at this time, I'm so excited to introduce to you a Blinn student who's gonna to talk to you about life beyond high school. Please help me give a very warm welcome to Ajaya Johnson. Hey, y'all. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, I'm a jam. It's nice to meet all of you. I've done this a couple times, so I don't know why I'm so nervous, so bear with me. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas. 
Uh, I go to Blinn College. I play for the women's basketball team. And today I'm just gonna talk to y'all a little bit more about what college is, what it takes to get to college, and how you can help yourself and others get there. So my first question, because I'm gonna get y'all a little involved. Raise your hand if you wanna go to college. Okay, okay. So raise your hand if you know what college you wanna go to. Okay, okay. What about you? What college you wanna go to? A and M, Giggum, okay. Anybody else? You. Harvard. I wish I was smart enough to go to Harvard. Okay. All right. So, why is college so important, right? So you have everybody talking to you, drilling you. You have teachers telling you that college is the way to go, that you have to, you know, you need to do this to be able to provide and get a better life, and you have your parents talking to you, telling you the same thing. So, I'm here to tell you the exact same thing. College is really important. Um, it takes a lot in a person to be able to go and get through college, even to even begin to want to go to college, and most of y'all, all of y'all want to go to college, so that's a great start. Some of y'all already know where y'all want to go, and that's cool too, but if you don't, it's okay, you have time to figure it out. But college is the one thing that separates people when, what am I trying to say? I told y'all to bear with me, y'all. Mind going blank. Um, it's important to get that piece of paper, is what I'm trying to say. Because you can have, you can apply for a job, right? And you can be going up against somebody who didn't go to college. They might have more experience, but they don't have that piece of paper with their name on it for their degree. But you do. Do you know who that employer is going to pick? Y'all smart. I like that. Yeah, they're going to pick you. Because you went through the process, you took the years out to do it, and now you have a degree. So I'm going to talk about what it takes to get to college. I'm a freshman at Blim. So I was just in high school last year, okay? And I remember going day after day after day, college application. Y'all know what FAST is? FAFSA. Every year, FAFSA. Um, filling out scholarships, trying to go on visits to see what I wanted to do. And it can be really, really confusing, but that's why y'all have teachers who are willing to stand by you and walk you through the process. I have parents, y'all even have each other. Um, tell one another to maybe go one day, let's go apply for some colleges, or let's go apply for some scholarships. It's better if y'all do it together because that way y'all can help each other out and it's a really good experience as well. So why, does anybody know why they wanna go to college? Anybody? Okay, give me one. Give me one. Money? Money? That, yeah, that's my reason too. Okay, 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 okay. So I'm hearing success, I'm hearing money, I'm hearing to get a good job, and all of those are great reasons. It's great for you to even have a reason to want to go to college. So, that y'all already on the road to success right there. Y'all ain't even did nothing but sit down. So, it's very important for y'all to understand what it takes for you to be able to go through the college process. Now, a lot of people might say that college is all about hard work and you have to study really hard and you have to go through all your books and you can't have any fun and that's not true because let me tell you about me. <laughs> I study really hard. I graduated at the top of my class in high school. But guess what? When they was ready to turn up, guess who was there too? Me. <laughs> so it's okay to have a little fun in between, you know, down the road, but don't lose focus. And that's one of the biggest things that kids forget to do when they get to college because it's so much freedom. You don't have your mom getting you out of school or getting you up for school. You don't have anybody telling you that you have to go to class because you have that 8 a.m. and you tired. Ain't nobody gonna force you to go to class. 
So you have to be disciplined enough to be able to take time out your day and go to class, do your studies, work hard, and stay focused because in college it is very, very easy to get distracted. But you have to keep your goals in mind. Like when I asked y'all why y'all wanted to go to college, y'all gave me those answers. Make sure when you go, you keep those goals in mind. So now I'm a freshman, right? I just got to school. I'm gonna tell y'all the truth about college. Like when you really get there. Not what everybody tell you happens when you get there. When you really get there. So my schedule is pretty open, right? I have three classes in the morning, and after that, I have practice and I'm done. So all of that free time, you have to yourself. So like I was saying earlier, it's about what you make it. Because if I have a test the next morning or the next week, or if I have homework to do, that's my number one priority. Yeah, we can go to a party later maybe, you know, if I'm filling up to it, but your studies are your priorities. And it's in all of y'all to be able to get to college, get through college, and come out with that piece of paper because it's so important. So that's all I got for y'all today, okay? We're gonna take about a five minute break right now. I'm gonna ask that you stay in your seats and then we will introduce our next speaker. Testing, can I have your attention everybody? I know some of you are going to the ladies room, the men's room, but everybody else, can I have a check-in with you right quick? All right, can I have a check-in? Now listen to the folks that are, to the, to the few folks that are going out. This is not a time to go and congregate in the hallway. We still have school going on, right? All right, clap your hands if you're enjoying yourself so far. Doesn't sound like most of you are enjoying yourself. Clap your hands if you're enjoying yourself so far. Okay, okay, so if I could just have your attention for a few moments. Can, can somebody, hello? Can somebody who is willing to come to the mic and share a couple of points from our first guest speakers? of what you've learned today. Anybody willing to come up? Anybody willing to come up? Come on down, son. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, here we go. Come on, come on, come on. Right, Let me have your attention. Everybody else remain seated. Remain seated. Let me have your attention. Please remain seated. We're going to hear from two, two young men, and y'all are going to give us maybe a couple of points each that you've learned, and, uh, and then we'll go forth and we'll introduce our next speaker. All right, my name is Carson Holton, and today I learned that you only get out of it what you put into it. Like, you can't just expect everything without putting any work for it. And, I mean, if, you, if you're not dedicated to what you want to do, you're never going to be good at it. Uh, I'm, Jack I'm Jack Schneider, uh, from my boy Coach, Coach Ramsey told me today, and every day, um, everything matters, there are no little things, celebrate all the little things and it'll eventually lead you to wherever you want in life. Okay, at this time, it is my pleasure to bring up to the stage one of our favorite Brenham ISD performers. Please give a round of applause for Ryan Fothery.
Please help me welcome Andy Harrington, who's going to teach you how to be a team. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask my students not to uh, go crazy over here. I know I got some students, some of my students in here as well. Um, I speak, or I teach dual credit uh, economics uh, here as well. Uh, I love that. Um, and I have this lecture uh, to them. And uh, I've done this for 13 years, and I can't believe it's been that long. Before I start, uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for this opportunity. I, I enjoy this. Uh, I, I couldn't see myself doing uh, anything else sometimes. Congratulations to you, because I know that you were selected to be here. Uh, and I added this last part into my speech. The girl that was singing, that was phenomenal. I mean, I, I took my cat right there. So that's a great job. All right? Um, but today we're going to talk about how to be a millionaire, okay? And like I said, I've done this for about 13 years, and I had some phenomenal instructors and teachers that kind of poured into me, and uh, I said, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to do the same thing. Well, what I started to kind of see was when I was doing this, I would put all these numbers up, and I would show, hey, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And it was a really cool lecture. I think kids liked it. But then I would talk to my students after class. They're like, man, that was a really cool lecture, Harrington, but let's be real. You know, I'm not even a millionaire. I was like, well, you missed the point. And it hurt me. Because I was like, you're, you're the reason I'm giving this speech. So I really have kind of changed up my lecture on how to be a millionaire because of them. So the first part of my lecture is basically showing you it's possible. And yeah, I'm gonna have some stories within that I'll have, and I'll also have some statistics of millionaires and who they are and what they are, etc. <coughs> but if I can have your eyes, right now, let me see your eyes. I'm an old coach, I got a baseball guy in me, so I, you'll know, probably have some coaches up here. What I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with me. It took me a long time to talk. Hello? Oh, it took me a long time to be able to talk about this because I didn't want this to be showy. Hey, look at me. Look at me. It's not about me. It's about you. But I think you have to be able to see a little bit of you and me and some of these millionaires to go, you know what? I can do that. So that's where this is coming from. It's not about me, it's about you. Start now. As a kid, I loved fire engines. And I remember getting to play on fire engines around Christmas time because Lots of good-hearted people donated canned goods and food to the needy. You know who the needy was? This guy. They would bring over the canned goods and the food for us, and I'd get to go play on the fire truck. It was awesome. I thought everybody got to play on the fire truck. Did you get to play on the fire truck as a kid? You did? Yeah, see? 
I wish I would have met you when I was in high school because then I wouldn't have felt as bad. So we didn't have a lot of money. We got food donated to us at Christmas. It was a memory of mine. We were on free and reduced lunches. I think lunch cost, us, cost me 25 cents. 25 cents for lunch because we were poor. But growing up, I didn't realize that I was poor. I just thought, everybody's like this. I mean, I didn't go to bed hungry. It was fine. But as I got older, I started to go, you know what? Well, you are kind of poor. But I always thought, you know, it's, it's that's my lot in life. I, I, I'm gonna, not that's my lot in life. I, I'll be a little bit richer, but there's no way I'll ever be a millionaire. It'll never happen. Just gonna be a, maybe a little bit better than my parents. But I had some phenomenal teachers, mentors pour into me. Thank you, Miss Atkinson. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Thank you, John Pope. It showed me, you know what? There's a different way. My senior year of high school I had a great economics teacher. It's probably why I became an economics teacher. Who knows? But her name was Miss Atkinson. And she called it Financial Life Lessons Day. She went over basically this same stuff. I was like, wow. She put up a calculator that day that opened my eyes where I was like, you know what? I'm going to stink and be a millionaire. And I'm going to be a millionaire by 30. Here we go. Needless to say, blessed to be able to play baseball in college. I wanted to be a college baseball coach. So I was a college baseball coach and teacher here at Blinn. I remember being 23, 24. Looking up going, man, I'm living in the dorm. <laughs> I better get on it if I'm going to be a millionaire by 30. I remember waking up, turning 30, and I wasn't a millionaire. I ain't going to lie to you. It was not a fun day. I didn't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm a failure and the world's over. But I didn't feel very good. Because I failed at my goal. But six years later, my wife and I crossed over and we were millionaires. And I'm not telling you that because it's not about me. It's about you. You think growing up we talked about stocks or bonds or PE ratios? No. We talked about what are we going to have for dinner? Am I real? Yeah. You can reach out and touch me. So here's one real example of somebody who grew up poor and became a millionaire. What about other millionaires? Is that normal? Well, let's see. There was a guy named Thomas Stanley. He was a professor at Georgia State University. And you know what he studied? What do you think he studied? Millionaires. He said, I'm going to study millionaires. What he studied. He said, you know what? I'm going to see what they drive, how they invest, what they wear, how they became a millionaire, where they live, etc. So he studies them and he writes this book. In the top left corner, you can see New York Times bestseller. It's a massive bestseller. Because it showed you what millionaires really do, who they really are. The statistic I want to pull for you, there's 11 million millionaires in the United States of America today, right now. When he studied the millionaires, he asked them, how'd you get your money? Because everybody knows it's because they inherited it. Try again. 81% of millionaires are first generation rich. 81%. So out of 11 million millionaires in the, in the U.S. today, 
It means about 9 million are first generation rich, meaning they didn't grow up with money. Mommy and daddy weren't millionaires. They built it. Eight out of 10. Very recently, Dave Ramsey does a study on millionaires. What's the most common job millionaires have? How'd you get there? Number one, engineer. Two, CPA. Three is a what? What is number three? No? Okay. Three is a teacher. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Three is a teacher. A teacher. What? Force management finds a turn. Barons, they are a publication that writes about rich people and then they sell that information to hedge fund managers, etc., cetera, uh, other rich people. They did a study in 2014. All the millionaires they surveyed, teachers, doctors, lawyers. So within the millionaires, you're looking at teachers, doctors, and lawyers. Teachers outnumbered doctors and lawyers combined. Teachers outnumbered doctors and lawyers combined. So, my first point, and the most important one, and five years ago was never even included in my lecture. You can be a millionaire. If teachers outnumber stock, uh, lawyers and doctors in becoming a millionaire, I think you've got a pretty decent shot. Remember, it's not about me, it's about you. Secondly, what are some things that we can do to be a millionaire? First off, we've got to stay out of debt. Okay? We've got to stay out of debt. Credit card, when you swipe a credit card at the end of the month, they're going to say, all right, you've got to pay us either what you bought, say if you buy something for $500, all right, you got to pay us that $500 back, or you can pay what's called the minimum payment, just a little bit of that $500, all right? So for example here, this person, we look at the rate, $1,500, the minimum payment, you, usually minimum payments is two to four to 4% 4 of your total balance. So that's $30 a month. So you buy something for $1,500, at the end of the month, they're gonna say, hey, you only owe us 30 bucks. Wow, that's awesome. But if you just make the minimum payment on that $1,500 at 19% interest, which most credit cards are 18 to 21% interest, and you just make the minimum payment, you don't pay it off, you're gonna pay $4,298 in interest alone. So what you bought for $1,500 actually cost you about $5,700 because you have to pay interest, which is basically the cost of, your, of that money that you didn't pay back. And as you get deeper into debt, $2,500, you pay $8,000 in interest alone. So you pay over $10,000 for something you bought at 2,500 bucks. So staying out of debt, especially credit card debt, is massively important. Now, that's rule number one. Secondly, the biggest asset you have is time because of compound interest. Okay? We're going to talk another story. Two people, Ben and Arthur. Ben starts investing $2,000 a month at 19 years old and goes from 19 to 26. Arthur invests two thousand dollars a month or two thousand dollars a year, sorry, going from twenty-seven to sixty-five. 
And we're just talking about investing in the stock market, basically all the stock market is. I'm not gonna get into big, long detail, but basically the stock market is a collection of companies. And when you buy a share of a company, you get to buy a piece of ownership of that company. So you're a part owner of that company when you own a, sh a share of stock. Now, let's look at Ben and Arthur and what happened with them. Ben invests $2,000 a year from 19 to 26. So he invested seven years, $14,000 total investment. At age 65, he's got $1.3 million. He invested $14,000. That's it, that's the entire amount of money he invested. 14 grand, and he's got 1.3 million at 65. Arthur, on the other hand, he invests $2,000 a year from 27 to 65. He invests for 38 years, which is $76,000, five times as much as Ben. And he ain't got what Ben's got. He's got 1.2 million. Starting to invest early is by far the most important thing you can do from an investment side because it allows you to take compound interest and use it. Let that sink in. Ben invested $14,000 and he has a million dollars. 1.3 million actually. So, what are the main takeaways? One, you can become a millionaire. If you're born in, or if you're in the USA, you have a massive advantage. If you're in Zimbabwe right now, totally different. Stay out of debt and invest early. Books. Three books I recommend. If you, want, if you care about it, you want to do it, first thing I would read, Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. Some of you, I know I have seventh graders up to seniors. It might be a little bit over your head on some of the stuff, life insurance, et cetera, but the concepts. Total Money Makeover, by far, I think that's the most important book you can read. Talks about getting on a budget, staying out of debt, et cetera. Secondly, little book of common sense investing. See the writing up at the top? See the guy's name, Warren Buffett? Who's, who's the best basketball player to ever play the game? LeBron, Michael Jordan, okay, somebody like that. Warren Buffett is the LeBron or Michael Jordan of investing. He's that, he is that, he's the best, he's the best investor in your lifetime, in your parents' lifetime. He is the best. And he basically says at the top, you need to read this book. So if LeBron James wrote a book about, or there was a book about basketball and LeBron James said, hey, you really need to read this book. And you really care about basketball? You'd probably read that book. That book is the main reason that I became a millionaire, or we became a millionaire at 36. I think we'd have still made it, but that's the reason that it, it's like a rocket fuel. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's the basics of investing. Lastly, Millionaire Next Door. Just explains who millionaires are, what they do, etc. But I would read that third if you're going to read it. Now, how much do I care about this? If you read any of these books, I will pay you for them. Yep. You read any of those books? That's my contact information. You contact me. You'll come up to my office. We'll sit down, we'll talk about it. You'll hand me your receipt, and I'll give you cash for your book. You keep the book, and it costs you nothing. It's up to you. Question. Well, if you come talk to me, I'll buy it from you, even though she bought it for you. Deal? Okay. You come talk to me, I'll give you. I'll buy you lunch that day. What's your name? 
Cool? Come talk to me. Okay? All right. So, all I ask is you use this and do this and use it in a positive way. Help people when you get there. That's all I got. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.